Test, test, what about the mic? Test, test, test. It's working? Yeah. All right. That makes all work more interesting. Oh, wow. Uh, all right. So yeah. All right. If you want to go to the top, yes. Many people don't do it. Shall we, uh, shall we dive in? We have the comfort zone and then we need. Yeah, yeah right. I think we're, it's that fast, right? Oh, yeah, in a minute. Give it a minute. I think we just dive in. I'm the, I'm the yeah. Okay. Uh, I think we're good to go. It's a half hour. I want to make the most of the time. Uh, any stragglers, feel free to come in. If you find a spot, you're all very welcome. So, uh, thank you for being here today. We're going to be talking about reframing the information crisis and how you see it so we can have a better chance to finally solve it. And we're going to cover such terms as you see here, info pollution, info obesity. And I'm really excited because of the panelists that are joining me today. I think hopefully this will be one of the most thought-provoking uh, and diverse set of perspectives you'll get on the subject at the conference. It's a bold claim because there's amazing sessions here, but that's what I hope. Uh, we've got Leanne here joining us, lead researcher at the BBC. Uh, where she leads the BBC's R&D Human Values team. Uh, Leanne is a psychologist, so she brings that perspective as well, focused on understanding the impact of digital technology on people across human values, ethics, and metrics, as well as using positive psychology to create positive outcomes and valuable experiences for people. Mark, uh, which if you're, uh, you've been coming to these conferences, you'll know, uh, is CEO of Kinzen, a startup developing solutions for people who want conscious control of their news experience. You might know that Mark spent 20 years in broadcast news as an award-winning foreign correspondent and TV anchor. And in 2010, he founded the world's first social news agency, Storyful, which I'm sure you've heard of, and was most recently Twitter's vice president of media partnerships in Europe. And last but not least, we have Paul, who is the principal advisor in the directorate uh, general for Justice and Consumers of the European Commission. And prior to that, he was director for fundamental rights and citizens' rights in the same directorate general. And so in his role, this hopefully is going to ring a bell for everybody here, in his role he led the reform of data protection legislation in the EU. Uh, and the no negotiations of the EU-US Privacy Shield and the negotiations with major US internet companies of the, and, uh, and of the EU Code of Conduct. So what we have here, hopefully, is a panel which brings together perspectives from platforms, um, the newsroom, psychology, and regulatory side. And I'll also add that I'm Mario Vasilescu. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Redocracy, 
which is a startup platform uh, dedicated to giving you more control and value and credit for the content you consume. And we'll talk a bit more about what each of us does towards the end. So uh, with that, why this panel? The reason for this panel is that the information crisis is now mainstream. I think we can all agree on that. It's in the headlines every week. You can't go a week without being at a social gathering where somebody at least mentions it in passing. And I think what crystallized how mainstream it is is when The Social Dilemma came out on Netflix. If you haven't seen it yet, it was a documentary about the ills and effects and mechanisms of social media. It was the first time ever that a documentary was the most popular movie of all, all the movies, on Netflix in a given month. So this is an issue that is now truly in the mainstream consciousness. But what I've noticed is despite it being mainstream, we struggle to talk about it. We struggle to talk about it as consumers. It seems like regulation often gets stuck in the mud. And it seems like we're stuck on it being this nebulous problem which we've never seen before and we don't know how to tackle. Which is true in some regards, but the thing is that humans have faced many great and complex challenges as our society has evolved and become more modern. And we can use these challenges as benchmarks because what you'll find is actually they are very relevant as analogies and lenses to help us solve the information crisis. So what I hope is with these lenses I'm going to quickly introduce you to, you will be equipped with perspectives and ideas and memorable ways of thinking about and tackling the information crisis. So I'm going to talk for about 10 minutes, hopefully less, um, through these three lenses to set the scene for you and reframe the crisis. And then the rest of the time, we'll dig into it with our great panelists. And then hopefully at the time, we have a bit of time for Q&A and resources. So the three lenses. It's going to be information obesity, information pollution, and information safety. So lens number one for the info crisis, looking at the obesity epidemic. It is not that long ago that these were the advertisements that we were seeing and they weren't laughable, there wasn't anything scary about it, this is what was acceptable because we didn't know any better. So what did we do about it? What did we do about the fact that parents could go into supermarkets and basically be buying and feeding their children sludge because they just didn't have the, the information to know any better? We obviously uh, brought in regulations on what could be promoted to you, so fast food joints couldn't come in and say, hey, you should be consuming a three kilogram burger every day. It's now illegal. We added transparency requirements on everything. You have to list the ingredients, you have to list nutrition labels and provide context. And we provided education so that every child coming out of school now has a pretty clear idea of different elements of nutrition and health. And so, as a result, just to prove how effectively this has worked, if I ask you to look at these two images, a lot of things will probably come to mind for every single person in this room. You'll think about calorie counts, you'll think about how it'll make you feel and look, You'll think about maybe work or government promotions on our health. You'll think about Fitbits and Whoop bands. There's all sorts of things that are going to come to mind instinctively when you look at food. And this is because we've been educated and conditioned. What happens if you look at this image? Where on the left, you have clickbait and outright misinformation. On the right, a few classic timeless pieces from objectively trusted sources. Outside of your own instincts or guilt, you don't have anything equivalent that comes to mind for the average consumer. But the fact of the matter is that people are spending at least seven hours a day consuming media. During the pandemic, Americans spent 13 hours of media every day. So it's a difference between having tons of context about how we feed our bodies and almost nothing to condi condition us about how we feed our minds. And the internet today is basically designed like a buffet that were designed to sit at and consume as much as possible every day. And fundamentally, the, app, you know, the analogy still suits that you are what you eat. And it's upstream of everything. You can see it in how we are becoming addicted. You can see it in depression. You can see it in violence, threats to democracy, and a fundamental pollution of truth. As we consume mindlessly, and there are no ways of regulating this yet or giving people that context. 
So it's about the obesity epidemic and framing it through the infobesity epidemic. And again, we can discuss with the panel, but also education. Should media literacy, digital literacy, informal logic be things that are mandated and must be taught from the earliest ages and throughout school? Context. Should big publishers above a certain size be forced to provide labels where polarizing language, loaded language, is automatically labeled, where they have to disclose their biases? Should these things be automatically mandated? Making it count. We've made people care more because we have calorie counts, we have fitness trackers, we have all these things. Is there a way of motivating people by making their consumption count in a similar way where it gets them benefits, it levels them up, they get special access? What would, would people care more then? And of course, advertising laws. If a fast food restaurant can't tell you to eat a three kilogram burger every day because it's unhealthy and illegal, probably a publisher which makes lots of money by feeding you clickbait and junk as much as possible probably shouldn't be allowed to do that either. These are ideas we can think about that are directly parallel. Lens number two, pollution and littering. The earth is a miracle. It's a self-contained ecosystem that gives us everything we need flying through space and yet somehow it does everything for us. But with the Industrial Revolution, we had a Wild West for quite a period of time where we didn't have any regulation yet on all the people who were exploiting the lack of regulation and polluting this home we had and polluting our physical commons, the place we share together so that we can have physical health. But we have another precious environment that we share together, and that's the internet. Today you can think of our shared information commons, our shared information space as basically being the internet. And whether you love him or hate him, especially in the recent context of Twitter, Elon Musk did have a couple of fantastic quotes when it came to summarizing the difference this has made. And he said, if you go back a few hundred years, what we take for granted today would seem like magic. Being able to talk to people over long distances, to transmit images, flying, accessing vast amounts of data like an oracle. It's like humanity acquiring a collective nervous system, whereas previous, previously we were more like a collection of cells. And so in the same way we have a physical space we all benefit from or suffer through, we have now an information space that we are intrinsically connected to and all contributing to and relying on for our day-to-day -day lives. Now, unfortunately, similar to some of the loopholes with industrialization and consumerism, we asked ourselves, the industry asked themselves, how will we make money with this thing? with this internet of ours? And the answer was more eyeballs equals more money. And so it started looking a lot like this. So in that way, we end up with something very parallel where this shared, precious, miracle space that we share is being polluted and in some ways, it's even worse because it's as if you would tell a factory owner to say, I will directly pay you more money the more you pollute this river. And this is the standard we started with. And so, again, if we look at it being like humanity acquiring a collective nervous system, what does it mean when we pollute and toxify that nervous system? Just like it would be our land, our air, and our water. But instead, it's how we think and how we feel about how we think. In some ways, it's no different from giving somebody a neurotoxin. So what did we do about it? What did we change? Of course, education, the importance of the environment. We made people understand and promoted how precious it was. We denormalized littering because it's very easy for me to throw this bottle outside on the grass. But once I see the context of what's happening in our oceans, uh, I get a very different appreciation of these small little actions. Uh, and pollution standards and laws that made it, you know, if you're a certain size in a certain area in a certain industry, there's different expectations of you. You can't just behave however you want in this shared physical space. And we can do the same things, you could argue, with our digital commons, our information commons, the importance of the shared environment that's probably not talked about enough, and this idea that is a miracle, a space that we share together and think together through. So lastly, information crisis lens number three. Um, road safety. The rise of modern personal transportation. 
In other words, giving people the ability to wield powerful machines, which they could easily accidentally cause a ton of damage with, or deliberately. And it's interesting because if you look at the earliest days of getting on the roads, people getting access to cars, it was chaos most of the time and quite dangerous. And it's easy for us to look in hindsight at all of these things and say, well, of course, we all have seat belts, we have all these roads and regulations and signs. Um, you know, we have nutrition labels, all these things, we have hindsight bias. It's very easy to think it's so logical, but that's not necessarily the case. And so again, what did we do about it? Safe operation features. Cars gradually got features where you simply can't operate them without these things being in place. The need for a driver's test and that you have to prove some competence and some training so you can wield this powerful machine. And of course, rules of the road. So we have highways, we have an information superhighway. Are you gonna blast yourself to bits flying too fast and without rules in any direction on the information superhighway? So, lastly, before we get to the panel, there is one essential consideration that I'm sure came to mind for quite a few of you, which is across all these lenses, the aspect of censorship. And I just wanna provide a couple of kind of caveats or points that will also hopefully help inform the panel. First of all, you can say, well, you're applying loose rules to people, you're restricting them, is this not censorship? Well, there's a difference between freedom of speech and freedom of reach. In other words, personal freedom for you to say what you want, but then a difference between the obligation and the expectation that everybody will also hear you, tens of millions of people, and the, the freedom to disturb others. They're different things. And also, consequence-free versus being labeled. So perhaps being able to say what you want, but also understanding that there may be consequences, there will be labels on your content over time, where people will at least be able to defend their attention span and their mind and have additional context before they let you get in there. Also, individual versus industrial responsibility. Just because you add rules to things doesn't mean that every individual will be regulated. Just like somebody littering outside in their front yard does not, is not beholden to the same expectations as a polluter who's putting tons into the air or into a river or in the ground, wherever it may be. There's different expectations. Maybe if you have over 50,000 followers on whatever service, Maybe that's when it kicks in, and everybody else is free to do what they want. Lastly, if these issues emerge today, I think it's important to understand that in the current highly inflamed and defensive environment, it would be easy to see how these same regulations that we consider so obvious and so inarguable would have protests happening. Oh, you're telling me I need a driver's license to drive my car? How dare you infringe my freedom of movement? I need, this was already happening, I need a passport to go into another country, well, why? And don't tell me what to feed my children. I should be able to do whatever I want, don't you dare come in here with suggestions. And so there's a lot of ways where you could see these same things that are common sense being pushed back against. So to recap, infobesity, which really comes more from a consumer angle, largely, but touches on platforms. Information pollution, which really touches on the producers. We have information safety, which is really about the rules, and then censorship as a consideration. So I wanna turn it now over to the panel, this great panel, which again, brings these perspectives across news, platform, psychology, regulation in one place. The first thing I wanna ask, and feel free to jump in in whatever order you want, which of these analogies jumped out at you the most and why? I think the um, analogy of uh, industrial pollution and the environmental challenge we are facing, uh, because the answer there of politics, at least in Europe, is the circular economy. So we have to introduce a system thinking which is oriented towards the UN sustainability goals and which starts at the moment of production, where we have to oblige producers already to produce goods in such a way that they don't need to garbage. And this system thinking, we also actually have it in the public sphere. This is the theory of the public sphere of Habermas, the great philosopher of the 60s already, um, who um, explains to us the constituent elements and the value of how 
a public sphere is shaped and how we build our opinion as individuals in democracy and under which preconditions this can really happen. Um, so I would say this analogy is quite interesting, but I would say in this presentation which you made, which I think is excellent, you're missing one point. And that is that at least one can argue that those who sell the fat food and are responsible for obesity largely, they want to make money, but actually they don't want to make people obese. They just want to make money. And those who produce industrial good, well, you know, they just want to make money, but actually they don't intentionally want to throw things away. But in the information crisis we are facing, there is a different intentionality, which is that, and this element is missing in your presentation, we are being profiled. Data is collected about us. We don't see this. And this data is used to target us intentionally with crap, namely to keep us on the screen as long as possible so that advertisement can be placed and that we start to buy. And so I think when we have a systems approach to the issue which we're facing, we can not only talk about the information side, free speech, news, what content are we getting, but we must talk about the underlying scandal, which is that while we are being told there's the great freedom now of access to information through Google, for example, through the search machine, you know, unprecedented access to information all over the world, at the same time we are being searched, our brains, you know, by trained psychologists who develop profile um, parameters, hundreds of parameters, and Google and Facebook and all these companies, they have parameters on us, thousands of parameters, according to which we are profiled and then targeted by the most powerful computers of this world, which then feed us through these algorithms the type of content which keeps us as long as possible on the screen. And that is an element of intentionality of examples. And I think that is the underlying issue which we also have to take into our systems view when we're discussing this issue. That was, um, that was great, and I just want to add the importance of revenue models, obviously another topic of this conference, and how do we justify the value of quality content? Um, it, I think you can't separate the two. Um, please. I think all analogies, all three analogies were really great because I think what they do is they provide a vocabulary for the problem that we often don't really realize is a problem. And um, so I think coming at it from different angles and different perspectives is, is kind of what we need because it is such a big problem. We need to sort of tackle it from different perspectives. I think for me, kind of in, in my sort of day-to-day, -day, um, being a researcher, psychologist, I think the infobesity angle and lens is particularly powerful because what it does is it makes it relatable. And I think that as human beings, we understand things more when they become relatable. So I think that the infobesity, because it sort of plays into our very sort of deep needs and values as human beings, in the same way that we need food, we need information. Like too much food and too much of the wrong food can manifest as physical symptoms. Too much information and too much of the wrong information can manifest as emotional or mental problems. Now, I know these are different contexts, so I don't think the analogy is, is perfect, but I think it just gives us that sort of lens and that vocabulary to speak about these things. And I think actually we're still in the discovery phase about understanding even on a food um, level that we're still discovering that we, we all are very individual we have individual needs and that we have individual differences regarding our dietary needs so that we do actually have individual differences for our information needs as well and i think coming at it from like the designer level and designing of these systems, I think that it is about being sort of mindful and 
having that awareness, both on an individual level, platform level, regulatory level, and I think it's not fulfilling immediate gratifications, which we know from a food angle and from all these other angles, it's so e easier to fulfill an immediate gratification than it is to think about the longer term future. So I think that um, on a kind of designing of these systems level, it's about not building techniques to keep people for as long as possible, because like we say, and we probably will speak about later on, the revenue and the sort of um, metrics problem um, is, has a lot to answer for. I think it's also on an individual level being self-aware and actually having the understanding of this enables empowerment and enables us to make better choices. Now it's not an individual responsibility, but I think just sort of from that psychological view, I think it, information is power. Yeah, and, and even just having that, that um, awareness, I mean, it, tons of studies that show that when you know you're being observed, uh, and you're supposed to behave well, or just, you know, it's gonna, the data's gonna be somewhere on you, whatever, it's fitness tracking, whatnot, your behavior changes. And just even equipping people or just something around that um, can change, can have a very dramatic change. And I'm gonna wanna come back also to um, the metrics. So we're gonna, I'm definitely coming back to that. So I'm gonna start off with words I never thought I'd hear myself saying at a journalism conference, but I agree with Elon Musk. Um, <laughs> at least in one sense, right? The internet is amazing. It is a shift in human consciousness, in the way we organize the societies. It is decentralized power to ordinary people to tell their reality. You know, there's now people who can say what they want to say in ways that were unimaginable when I started in journalism back in the early 1990s. And this was what forced me out of journalism, was the understanding when I saw places like Iran, it was young people with camera phones and connections to social networks that were telling the stories of revolutions. It still is. So anybody that has any kind of hankering for the good old days, the good old days, and I, believe me, I was 20 years in the good old days, they weren't that good when it comes to democracy. So when I started out, I would have gone for the traffic rule scenario. Um, when I started out with a social news agency, I thought that the problems we were seeing during the Arab uprisings, we were starting to see the beginnings of disinformation, were kind of like a byproduct, just a necessary sort of problem that we'd have to solve by setting maybe new rules, speed limits, by the externality, the kind of pollutant that was coming out of these systems, but we'd fix it eventually. We'd get a business model for journalism and we'd all go back to normal in some form and the platforms would give some money to the poor old journalists. And that's what I thought. And then I went to work for a platform and then I realized, holy shit, this is not what I thought. It wasn't a byproduct. This problem we were seeing in disinformation, the information crisis, was not some form of uh, you know, bug in the system, it was the system. The system was about overwhelming you with information to create passivity, a lack of consciousness of what was going on around you. One of the greatest critiques is actually someone speaking at another panel right now, uh, Peter Pomerantsev talks about censorship through noise. If you are faced with an overwhelming amount of information, then everything just looks untrue. And all the liar has to do is convince you everyone is telling a lie to win the case. So therefore, the system that makes you passive, performative, it makes us all have identities. We all want to share things because they say something about us. So we're actively seeking the outrage. We're actively seeking the confirmation bias. And so what I realized inside Twitter, full of great people, smart people, but missing these metrics. And I remember sitting in a and a meeting of top executives, and they were talking through all the data points they had on every human emotion. And I remember saying, what about serendipity? Do we have anything on serendipity? You know that feeling of emotion when you see a new idea? You know, something you didn't expect? That beautiful feeling when you're with somebody actually releases brain chemicals, oxytocin. It's the solidarity brain chemical. Ah, oh, someone's just said something really interesting, hopefully at this panel. That's not measured by platforms, and therefore, everything is all about your passivity, doing things. Marissa Mayer famously from Yahoo said, people will always do the easy thing. So obviously we've got to make the right thing easy, right? So I think the traffic analogy doesn't work. I think the pollution analogy doesn't work because it just assumes there's kind of just a byproduct, you know, a pollutant as a consequence of the system. I think obesity gets close to it. I would argue that the internet has changed the metabolism of humanity. It's changed the consciousness of humanity. It's rewired the way that we interact with each other and therefore it is a much more fundamental problem 
and I would compare it to public health crises like the epidemic, I kind of feel, first of all, the last 10, 15 years has reduced our immunity systems and has made us more prone to the infections of misinformation, conspiracy thinking. Uh, it's made us more uh, liable to be hijacked and, and manipulated and weaponized uh, by people who realize the immunity, uh, people like the Putins of the world. I mean, they know they're lying. We know they're lying. They know we know they know they're lying, but they still lie. Why? Because a little nudge, given the low level of immunity, can create a global fact on the ground. So from my point of view, I go with obesity, but I do think right now there's a much deeper problem which I think is analogous to a pandemic. And therefore, we are going to have to take corrective measures right now, both inside platforms uh, and at government and, and supranational level, to put out this, this fire, this spread of a disease. The problem is a lot of the things we'll have to do right now to try and bring this disease back under control and try and fix this metabolism potentially are counterproductive. Um, I certainly remember being in Twitter, being told by Jack Dorsey that we were the free speech wing of the free speech party. And, and I'm still a libertarian in that sense at heart, but at the same time, what do we do to try and stop lies? What do we do to try and stop toxic debate? And in that question, I think, uh, and the answer to that is the biggest difficulty of getting us where I think we need to be, similar to food labeling, uh, where we know when we walk into a supermarket, we know exactly what we're buying, what kind of contaminants it has within it. I think eventually we're going to get to a point where information is labeled in a similar way to trigger the friction, to stop you buying the thing that's fatty or full of carbs. But the journey between there, where I think your Mario in an excellent presentation are kind of leading us, and where we are right now is perilous. You know, it, it putting in framing of history, when the printing press was invented, it didn't bring world peace. It created the longest period of violence in human history. And so therefore, I'm not saying we're gonna have a hundred years war, but I do feel in this next few years, um, we are literally on the side of a precipice uh, for I think humanity, and I think that's how serious it is. I, <clears throat> there's something I was hoping you'd, somebody here would cue me up to say, which I'm really glad you did. On the point of friction and context, there's something called Brandolini's Law which is also known as the bullshit asymmetry principle. And it really goes hand in hand to that old saying that uh, a lie can make it twice around the world while the truth is putting on its shoes. And I think when we talk about this need to introduce that friction or to make you think twice, I think friction and crucial elements that are gonna be part of this perilous path and where we go forward um, so that the ease with which a lie moves and with the ease with which somebody can create and proliferate a lie is no longer so much easier and frictionless than the effort it takes to then cover up after it with the truth. Um, and I just think that's a, if you don't know about Brandolini's law, I think we could solve so many things if we found a really good solution to that. Um, so anybody else have any comments? Because there are so many great things here, yeah, yeah. Yeah, on the point of friction, the point of friction, I think, is so important. And again, taking it back to that individual psychology kind of need level, I, I'll give you an analogy. So something like a cookie, a chocolate bar, those sorts of things that we find highly palatable, we are more likely to consume in high quantities. And if we're sat down, and if, say, if we sat and we eat a cookie or a chocolate, and then somebody feeds us the next one, we're very unlikely to say no because it sort of tastes nice. But then we think about the element of friction. Now to maybe get another one, we would have to, there'd, there'd be all these steps in place so that you might have to go into another room, go into the kitchen, open the door, open the cupboard, open the packet, you get, you get my drift. There's always friction built into human behavior. We read a book, we have chapters, they're sort of natural stopping points in our behavior. And I think what has happened now is that this whole element of friction, and it sort of taps into our psychology, it's we're having to look for stopping cues ourselves 
because when we have design and coming back to the point of design of systems, we have things like autoplay, we have infinite scroll. At what point do you know that you've had enough? And it's the same when you take it to the cookie analogy, there's probably a point at which you start feeling sick. And it's the same of when you continuously scroll through content or continuously, you know, what we might term binge watch TV, there becomes a point when your mind or your, you get a headache. So I think that friction is really important because I think as human beings, we, our environment has always been set up to have these points of stopping cues and that they've just been removed now with the design of sort of digital services and digital, the sort of digital information landscape. So I think it's for us to find ourselves, which I think is, is just really difficult. Absolutely. The, um, it, it does remind me, like, it, again, coming back to the regulations we now have on fast food and what they can promote and tell you to do, it does feel like things like infinite scroll should potentially be regulated in some way. It, it doesn't seem like something that uh, you should be able to implement uh, just on your own or without it, especially at a certain scale. But in any case, so um, I want to now come back to the aspect of metrics and measurement. And something I found really interesting in talking to you, Leanne, was the difference between, um, you know, exactly what we talked about, what's good for us versus what we want. I mean, you can think of a, you know, is a good friend somebody who tells you the truth or a friend who's always agreeing with you? And, you know, we say, well, these algorithms or these platforms, like, you know, it's the best because it's made just for you, this perfect algorithm. It's like, is that, is that actually... Like if you're make it a person, is that what you would want? So coming back to the idea of values versus value, um, I'd just be curious if you have any thoughts on that when it comes to as, as you have the human values framework, which we'll hopefully get to talk about a bit. Um, actually, here, now's a good time. Could you, could you tell us a bit about the human values kind of work you do and how that flows into the design process and how that's supposed to impact, yeah. So um, the human's value framework is essentially a look at kind of psychology of media and digital behavior. And it was just a way of almost tackling the sort of metrics problem. So when we have metrics of things like time spent, attention, eyeballs, which we know operate on a business level, operate on an individual level through likes and clicks and hearts and thumbs up and whatever kind of emojis we have now, um, numbers essentially. And it sort of goes back to a way of reframing like what we value in life, like from that fundamental sort of psychological level of what is a deep-seated need. And the way in which the, the work has manifested is through trying to go into digital design in a more sort of ethical and mindful manner to question teams and question people, not just to say, because what we found was that we would have conversations with people who would be saying things like, oh, how do I increase my number base? How do I increase the time that people spend on the platform to reframe that to thinking about what's actually valuable to people? Things like enabling people to grow as people, enabling people to be safe and well. So a lot of the sort of well-being type of metrics. And we, as a team, um, inside the BBC R&D, we try to find ways in which we could measure, the, measure these things. So we would have alternative and complementary measures of value, measures of success, so that when teams would actually ask their audience, like whether they, even as simple as, did, did you enjoy what you consumed or did you learn anything new? And it's just these elements that we know are really important to people on that sort of deeper sort of psychological level. Mm -hmm. On that note, actually, um, I think it's so interesting because if we think about the platforms um, and publishers, but especially the platforms, the lack of better metrics leads to poor behavior. You incentivize for what you measure, and if you're, in, if you're measuring poorly or narrowly or your own definition of value versus 
values, let's say, or what's you know a more a more holistic version of value to a person, um, we go down a dangerous uh, path. And Mark, this kind of leads into what I wanted to ask you. You were at Twitter, um, you know, with the work you do now with Kinzen. I think you're thinking about this a lot. Where, how, how can we change the platforms, or where does this all fit into the platforms, given their metrics are seen for so long to be so toxic and are so uh, inextricably, inextricably linked to their, um, the way they work and why they exist? I think, you know, to be honest, the, the relationship between journalists and platforms is so fraught, um, and I'm not necessarily on the side of the journalists within this context, because I think with platforms, it's more an expression for me, the way platforms have been built, of capitalism in a kind of a late decaying stage than it is of, you know, some nefarious plot by about, you know, 10 people in Silicon Valley to, to take over the world. It's not that way at all. I mean, money, right? It's all about money, because advertising, um, is built on algorithms that are making you feel something so they should be more emotive and you'll be receptive to advertising to buy things. And so I remember this skewed thing so greatly. I remember once I used to go around giving a pitch about Twitter very proudly saying 79% of Twitter's users are outside the United States. And it would go down well. And then one day I was with an executive in the company who said, yeah, but 80% of our revenue comes from the United States. And that, that for me, I remember the fundamental dichotomy between this. Like, in the end of the day, the people that are protected by trust and safety organizations in these platforms are where the average revenue per user, ARPU, is higher. It's exponentially higher in the U.S. and English-speaking countries than it is in Africa or Asia. And so, therefore, that's where the resources go to protect people. So, as of last year, there was no machine classifier to prevent this information in Hindi, one of the most spoken languages on the planet. And so that is starting to change. Because I think what's happened is inside these platforms, there's a little bit of a civil war battle, battling it out between the people on the growth side and the, the, the number side. And those people who say, Do you know what, safety by design has to be one of our fundamental pillars. And over the last couple of years, we're starting to see interesting things happen. It was already starting in Twitter when I was there. Uh, I certainly can't take credit for it. Um, but I think the friction idea is being tried out in Twitter to huge success. Just saying to somebody, have you read that article that you're about to share? Because the headline made you so emotional. And the responses have been amazing. The statistics show that it's actually changing people's behavior. So it's starting to happen. Where I think there's still huge problems is in the way the algorithms themselves have been built. So it's a bit like 2008, and all the banks were using these credit default swaps and derivatives. And there was maybe a handful of people who actually knew how they worked. In fact, probably nobody knew how they worked because they'd grown out of control. And we're in a similar position right now in the fundamental recommender systems that, remember, are the editors. Now, platforms like to say, we're not editing. They are. They're, they've got algorithms that are acting as mechanical editors under no one's control. And I heard someone recently say that maybe 250 people in the world understand how the recommendation systems now work because they are so complex and are learning themselves from behavioral data. They're primed to say, how can we get that person to sit there for 12 hours? Um, and that's their metric because they can sell more things. Now, they're starting to change now because you're starting to get metrics brought in around safety, which are fundamentally revolutionary if we can pursue it, where you actually have a reverse recommender system. It's back to your freedom of reach versus freedom of speech idea. The machines can actually be classified to see when we start to see manipulative behaviors at play in information feeds to see when we can see slurs and uh, radicalized terms and dog whistles and, uh, being used in languages uh, and build better classifiers in languages of the world, thousands of spoken languages. And that work is going on inside the platforms. I work with a lot of these people. Part of my job is to provide an editorial network that is feeding data and intelligence into classifiers that are picking this stuff up. Now, when I talk to platforms, the word journalist is, is a bad word. If you're a journalist, they don't want to talk to you because they've been beaten over the head for years. And I'm talking about these are the good people, the heroes inside the platforms. You say to them, well, we need sort of editorial analysts. And they go, yeah, yeah, that's what we need. We need editorial analysts to tell us about context and culture and language and to spot the people trying to hijack. Yeah, we need those people, analysts. And so it's really funny, because I lead a team of journalists, uh, we've got an editorial network, but on the end of the day, you know, they're so, they're so sort of phobic about the idea of making judgments that they find it hard to think in an editorial context. But again, as I say, that is starting to change, 
and some of the people I work with inside these platforms fundamentally are starting to use new metrics um, to do with safety, to do with violative view rates, to make sure that they know what level of contamination has crept into a news feed, to understand the ways in which uh, their products have been weaponized by the enemies of democracy, the way that free speech has been hijacked by people who don't believe in free speech, and they can find metrics to judge these levels of, and I'm going to say contamination and contradict myself earlier on, but to see where there is, um, you know, fundamentally attacks on our consciousness taking place. So it's a change. It's not radical. I think it's going to take time. It involves a lot of trade-offs. It involves a lot of very undemocratic processes right now, and that's where I think regulation is going to be critical, is not to focus on banning certain types of content, but exposing the algorithmic accountability that's necessary, the transparency, the processes to oblige a platform opening up in a market in Africa to fundamentally have a set of classifiers that can detect the most harmful content or they just don't get in there. I fear, to be quite honest, a lot of the backlash from politicians and, to be honest, the media is about protecting their own elite status. And so I always take a grain of salt when I hear politicians uh, talking about what they're going to do to, you know, send platform executives to jail, or and I hear journalists saying we just need more truth. You know, fundamentally, this is no longer about truth. It's about trust. Trust has been eroded. And to rebuild that, I think there has to be a partnership between people who build these platforms and editorial analysts or journalists or whatever we're going to call ourselves, um, and, and new metrics to measure, I suppose, the safety and the health uh, of our ecosystem. So that's my kind of terribly unfulfilling answer to that question. We're in, we're in progress now. I, I want to add to it the, um, the point of context again. So I agree with everything you said, and I, I hope we kind of get there smoothly and faster. But also in the meantime, just algorithmic transparency. So there's a big push for algorithmic transparency. Why I should have a prominent button on every single post, or if I want to, I click it and I get a sense of why I'm seeing what I'm seeing and how it might feed into what I'm going to see next. That, that itself is a very powerful thing to have, uh, which just doesn't exist right now. Um, I just add yeah. to you that machine learning transformers, which are probably one of the pro parts of progress of the last two years that are undervalued, have revolutionized the way in which we can start to think about the automatic labeling of information or content. Uh, based on things like semantic similarities, where you see language like this is like this. And I mean, I've got presentations from the engineers that work at my company that have blown my mind because it feels very human. These human uh, machine learning transformers that are actually trying to understand our consciousness and reflect back the best in us. Mm -hmm. So the last couple of years with things like BERT and GPT-3, they have dangerous potential outcomes but they also are fundamentally revolutionary in allowing us to start going down the road of a labeling system uh, where there is human in the loop mm. solutions, uh, but the machine is starting to learn quicker in a way that defends us better. I want to cue in Paul um, on the subject of visibility and uh, what is understandable. There's risks we can easily see and then there's risks that are more invisible. And I'm just curious, first of all, I'm guessing you're itching to comment on a few of the things you've been saying. And even, even your contacts want to chime in as well. Um, but uh, but I, I would love to hear if you also have any thoughts, because I think it's fascinating to talk about the fact that maybe part of the challenge is the fact that these effects are more invisible and what analogies might exist around that, what examples exist around invisible, invisible risks. So I'd just love to hear if you have any thoughts on that. Yes, um, so first of all, I think um, it is important to uh, discuss uh, this matter with the experience in uh, media generally in mind. It's of course a new age and everything is different, but um, there is a correlation between uh, the world going haywire uh, in terms of populism, autocrats, dictatorship, and the way politics has shaped the media environment. So it's very clear where we have dictatorships and no media freedom, things go wrong. You know, Russia can only go to war because it's a dictatorship and Putin can push a button and certain news disappear and platforms have no access. In Europe, we can also see there's a very clear constellation between uh, countries which have a relatively good public service media environment 
and those who don't, and countries which have, and it's actually not only in Europe, which have populism and, you know, new type of right-wing extreme uh, parties growing. Uh, where you don't have public service media, media which are not following only the profit obligation, of course, nothing is perfect there, and they are also weak and they have mistakes, but it's better to have them than not to have them. I think it is better, and you know, democracy cannot function, in my view, if you leave the public sphere entirely only to the market, and we see it in the US. The American democracy is broken in many ways. They can't make laws anymore in, in Washington. They don't get it done. It's, the Congress is in the hand of money, and Trump you know, was the first warning, and the next election, you know, he will be back, and it will be much worse. So I think one of the key issues here is it's not all going to be solved by private parties, even good willing private parties, alternative actors and so on. We need in this sphere so important for democracy, for the public discourse, we need a mix between a plurality of private actors and the state and politics have a duty to maintain this plurality, and I'll say a word about this in a moment, and public actors. That's the first, so I, you know, I think public TV, has a lot of faults and public radio has a lot of faults, but without them, it's worse. When it comes to maintaining the private plurality, we have to bring back the money to the private content actors which have been taken away by the platforms. The business model of the platform has led to two companies, Facebook and Google, cashing in 80% of the new internet advertisements, and that is money which previously was available to the press and that's why you can buy a newspaper now at the cheap. And that is a problem for democracy. So I think, you know, we have to think about how to address this new dominance in the advertising market. And it is not good that these two companies first take the money and then they sponsor congresses like this and they give money away, you know, as friends to all the press. Well, I mean, you know, that creates dependencies and, you know, it makes the press very tame when it comes to doing their key job, which is to control power, the power of the state, but also private power of these companies. The press should be going after them. Instead, they have to beg for the money. Not good. So that is the first political element. The second political element, I would say generally is, it's great to think about technological and innovative solutions, and there the market is perfect, and I'm sure the market, there is also an element of the market which can provide a solution. But politics cannot cop out um, uh, of the responsibility to shape the public sphere. And shaping the public sphere is not only about maintaining public uh, uh, media as in a mix between private and public and competition law addressing the issue of dominance of platforms and you know, the money uh, issue for the press. There are other elements. And this is, for example, where we come to the transparency on algorithms, or for that matter, that pe people can know what data is uh, collected about them, how it is used, and so on. And this is what laws need to provide. And that's what we're trying in Europe. I mean, you know, we have GDPR, which gives every one of you the right to ask for deletion of your data, to ask what is happening with your data, to actually look to some degree into the algorithms. There's an academic debate on how far your rights are going, but I think you know, if you want to look into the algorithm, you should ask for it. And if you don't like the answer, you know, there are ways to go to court and to get organized with civil society. I think these are issues will, which will come to litigation. We also have the new Digital Services Act uh, now in Europe, which obliges the companies to take structural measures to um, uh, improve, let's say, um, the democracy-friendly and fundamental rights-friendly function of the platform. So, you know, and there we get into this field of, we don't want censorship, we don't want content control, but we want the platforms to take responsibility for democracy in the sense that they recognize that they are not only marketplaces, it's not only places to make money, the platforms are today the places where more than 50% of the population build their political view, and that's very important for democracy, and the companies have to take responsibility for that. 
And this is where the law helps a little bit. It will never be a perfect solution. Let me say at the end, I'm fascinated by this panel, especially what I hear from Mark, because you know, I, in my job, I have negotiated with these companies a code of conduct against hate speech and incitement to violence on the internet. And when you ask the companies, what can you do? The answer first is we can do not much. Well, and technology mm, doesn't work. Uh, so my experience is, unfortunately, that the companies lie about their capacities. They love to use their capacities on content recognition, for example, for making money. And they must have perfect content recognition systems. The better the content recognition, the better you can place advertisement. You know, if the machine knows automatically, you know, you're putting up a video on the shoes of your girlfriend. Next comes in a millisecond an advertisement on shoes. So that is their business model. When you then say, please use your capacity, your technological innovations, not just for profit, use it in the public interest. Help us to get anti-Semitic or incitement to violence against refugees down. You know, let's meet at the corner and everybody bring their baseball stick. You know, I don't need a long analysis to know that that is a call for violence against the refugee camp around the corner, yeah? Oh, well, that's very difficult, you know, it could be irony. So, you know, long discourses and so on. So I think it is, this type of discussion here is important because we need to push the companies First, to be honest about the technological realities and technological capacities, and then we have to oblige them to use them also in the public interest. And there, to find the right line between criminal content and radical free speech is very important. Obviously, we don't want to go into a situation where these companies become, uh, you know, the, the censors or, you know, a ministry of truth. Obviously not. But we have to recognize, we have criminal content, and in Europe, more content is criminalized than in the US. And that is also something where we Europeans don't have to walk head down. You know, it is not a shame that we say denying the Holocaust is a crime in Europe. And I don't think we need to take lectures from Americans about free speech, you know, in a country, from a country where Top journalists who speak about Edward Snowden and American spying have to leave the country because they fear the state coming down on them. Europe, in terms of press freedom, regularly is in front of the United States. So I think you know, we have to impress also on these American companies that they have to obey our laws, what is criminal content in Europe. You know, I think there's no pride in having people storm on the Congress and Facebook, uh, you know, selling to the guys who, where they see with a mobile phone, they're coming with violence close to Congress. They're offering, you know, in the last minute to buy a bullet jacket. You know, great advertisement for these guys who, you know, uh, that type of freedom of speech, uh, which, which goes hand in hand with incitement to violence. You know, I think it is legitimate to say, sorry, we don't want this. We have laws which outlaws incitement to violence in public speech. And, um, and I think the companies are slowly learning, and we must insist towards them, that they obey our laws in the way they operate in Europe. I know it comes to the end, but 30 seconds, just a quick response. <coughs> I would say that I see very positive signs coming out of Brussels in terms of the Digital Services Act and the Code of Practice on Disinformation that's going to come, that there is an awareness of, of an accommodation that can be had, especially in the most egregious content. But I just want to say one word, decentralization. I think. My 17-year-old has more power on that phone than she'll ever have in a ballot box. And she thinks about everything in terms of the people around her, the authentic. She doesn't like journalists, she likes activists. And I think we have to know that decentralization is going to be a solution in giving us all the power to make better choices when these labels arrive in our feeds. But it's also going to fundamentally challenge us in the media. Because we've told ourselves over the last 10 years the solution for quality news was to go behind paywalls. And for me, that's analogous to saying the only good food you can get will be behind a paywall, right? And so we have to focus on public interest information, like a laser. That's what reduces polarization and offers the kind of solution to obesity, is quality public information. If we're not investing in that, no matter how successful your subscription strategy is, you are not solving the information crisis and you do not deserve to have politicians worry about your future. If I sound angry, it's only just because I think the public service media is the thing we've got to defend. 
and I, I don't think that has to be publicly owned, by the way. I think that can include local grassroots journalism. It can include TikTokers. Anybody who's committed to transparent, accountable reporting of our lives, giving us the chance to engage with our best intentions, not our worst instincts, is public interest information, and we should fight for that more than paywalls. So, thank you. Um, I know everybody was taking notes here. Uh, so, if we can get the slide that's currently um, on the slides on the screen. Um, that one. So this is a document which currently just has a few things in it, but I'm going to make sure to go to the, our fellow panelists here and we're going to add our notes. There's already a few resources in there. There's also a blog post which is going to summarize this entire presentation along with key ideas that maybe weren't discussed here. And so that's half done and we're gonna round it out after we have a conversation here. Um, and so, I know all of you have notes you've been taking through the conference. Just add that to your notes, and um, by the end of the conference, you'll see a document full of things. Right now, it's just an outline, um, but that's, that's where you'll find it. So just to wrap up the conversation here, there is, I, I wish we could talk more, and I, questions I wanted to ask you we haven't gotten to, but I th we've talked about all these things which are conventional, you know, things we already are aware of, the issues, these things that are emerging, but if we bring them back to those analogies, those lenses that we've already partially solved, I think it makes it feel like we can grasp them. Instead of something that feels so new and so nebulous and so how could we possibly deal with this and we take these ideas and put them through those lenses, then it's a framework to say, well, no, you know what? There isn't carte blanche here because you're some powerful platform we've never heard the likes of before. Guess what? We're gonna draw an analogy here to this and this is how we're gonna deal with it. And we can do it. We've done it before. These things, we have hindsight bias. These things weren't always so simple in these other fields. We can do the same thing with the information crisis. So that's the closing thought. And I'm going to make sure that we get a few more closing thoughts, which you don't have time for here in the document. Um, and also, you know what, I'll make the documents so that you can add comments if you have questions and we can try to put some thoughts there. I don't know if, do we have a couple of minutes here for a question? I don't know, it seems like people are still here so we're not gonna get kicked out. Um, any questions, quickly? There's one. Yes? Come on, here. Back. <laughs> um, I would like to know, so currently we're optimizing for um, my screen time, if you could take a magic wand and just optimize for something specific, it could be a value, I don't know, what would you optimize for? Rather than screen time. I would optimize for what's important in democracy, to be, be able to participate as a citizen in the democratic life. I would optimize for intention, that I went in to see something and I got what I wanted because it would help me make a decision in my daily life rather than, you know, buying something I didn't intend. So intention. I really like that intention, but I would, to add to that, probably balance. Uh, this is getting to the heart of what we're doing with our platform, Redocracy, which is uh, optimizing for also intention, but also awareness. So constantly being aware and having the metrics like a Fitbit for your own mind and consequences and rewards for how you spend your time. So optimizing around that so it actually matters tangibly. That's a great question. Great question. Very good question. Anybody right. else? One more. It's one yeah. questions. <laughs> I think we're okay. No, it's not you. Okay. I think we're good then if nobody wants to speak up. Um, thank you very much for so being here. One. Oh, there is. <laughs> So I wanted to ask you about digital citizenship, so um, Mark, if you want to. Yeah. I definitely think media literacy is a big, broad phrase, but I think um, teaching critical thinking um, to kids to be aware that they're being manipulated what the telltale signs are. So I think we should think more about critical thinking as the essential skill to get behind the wheel of a newsfeed. Um, so I think there is an analogy that definitely there, but I think once you're on that road, the idea of like looking for speed bumps or traffic lights or signals, you know, that's gonna be helpful as well, but it will all have to be about the idea of turning us into not users of platforms, but empowered digital citizens. Mm -hmm. And that, that is a shift that can't happen just by putting up some traffic lights. Yeah, uh, I, I totally agree with this sense of we have to teach uh, a critical attitude towards power. And uh, as part of that, 
the democratic control of technological power becomes a key function in the age of artificial intelligence. And we all have to engage in this. So this must be part of our, our life. This discourse about you know, learning to trust in the internet and trust in AI, well, I have my doubts. You know. I want people always to have a critical attitude. And, um, and I think we cannot leave um, this only to individuals. I think the function of criticism of technological power has to be institutionalized. So we must also insist as citizens that our parliaments, our governments, and so on get good in this and that they really understand how these algorithms work and represent our interest rather than saying, oh, you know, you guys have to go to school and learn it all. That's not possible. It's, you cannot leave just the individuals and these big companies. I mean, you know, politics and the state has a function and we as citizens must insist that they do their job. I mean, including Europe, of course. I think um, critical thinking definitely is part of the wider sort of um, range of sort of solutions. I think that if we're thinking critical thinking, what it does is it gives people personal awareness, which I think anything that increases education and awareness is part of a solution. I think the solution is also on regulations, it's on commercials, it's on platform intervention. So I think there's, it fits into a wider spectrum of things that we should be doing. But I think like transparency and other things that are not necessarily the solution, I think that it's part of that bigger um, thing. What I would want to add to that, which I really feel strongly about, is uh, terms of service which are educational. So rather than something you're not going to read or maybe something adjacent to that long legalese that you're not looking at, is something that essentially would give you a badge to show it doesn't necessarily restrict you, but at least others would see that you did your homework. And you, had a, you have agreed and you are aware of what it takes to be a good citizen of the information commons. Maybe it doesn't limit you in any way, maybe it gives you some extra rewards. Maybe, it, again, that badge, people seek badges on Twitter. Um, I think that's very important. So at least people, first of all, it has a function of educating people who actually might have not taken the time to understand the fundamentals in different directions. But it also makes you say publicly a little commitment of, I have understand what it takes to be responsible here, and it's attached to me now, and I'm, you know, I understand the consequences, not just in legalese, but I've learned about it, and you can see it on my account. That's also nice because the idea of a badge plays into our kind of needs and values as people to be recognized, to be valued, and to all of our sort of self-esteem needs. So I think um, having that sort of recognition is, is something that is, is key. Mm -hmm. I think, yeah, I think that's a good note to end on. Uh, again, we'll, I'll make commenting available on the document. Thank you to these amazing panelists. First of all, a uh, round of applause for them, please. I, uh, I hope this will leave you with some lasting perspectives on how to think about the information crisis differently. And thank you for being here in a conference which is so full of amazing sessions and perspectives. So thank you very much.